Welcome to Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan, a podcast about the art and hobby of miniature painting. I'm Mike. Thank you so much for joining us on our continued quest to become better, braver, happier painters. Uh, today, not much fluff. Uh, I just have to start out with an apology to our two guests, uh, Eric Swinson and Stephen Garcia. Thank you guys for your patience. Uh, I have to admit, this is supposed to be out uh, a weeks ago, but I got caught in a painting wave that I, you know, I... Part of me is sorry. I feel bad that I didn't get this out. The other thing, though, is that I have three of my four projects for ReaperCon done, which is crazy because I was finishing all of my uh, all of my projects last year at ReaperCon. So, um, thank you guys for your patience, your wonderful guests, and as I've already spoiled, our our guests today are Eric Swinson uh, and Stephen Garcia. They are two fantastic painters who've been on the show before, but uh, we wanted to touch base with them this time because they went to the World Model Expo and, uh, you know, a little bit of Go USA. They did uh, damn well, uh, each receiving gold medals. I, I believe Eric got two gold medals and Stephen got a gold and a silver, which is in the math, both of which are in the master's category, which is totally awesome. So sit back, relax, and enjoy uh, this interview with two fantastic artists and even better, uh, two wonderful people and great friends. So Eric Swinson and Stephen Garcia, welcome back to the show, guys. Thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate the invite, man. Definitely awesome to be on here with you guys. I mean, the, the last time we talked, um, as it's been a while, a lot has gone on since then. Uh, Adepticon, Las Vegas Open, and one of the reasons why we brought you on the, both on the show is because you just both got back from the World Model Expo. And so why don't we like dive into that and just talk about, well, why don't you guys give me uh, your overall experience from the World Model Expo? Eric, go ahead, man. Take first track. Uh, I mean, so I would say that, yeah, we, we talked about it just before the show, just a tiny bit, but like it was my first experience at like a big international show, like in being like a professional in the industry now, right? Like Adepticon was a taste of it, but like working with a lot of these European brands and getting to meet everybody in person for the first time, like besides some of the instructors that come stateside, like was uh, super cool and it's like, coming home to a family, you know, you get to know all these guys online, but getting to, to talk and hang out for the first time, like in person is, is great. And everybody's super welcoming. And, um, yeah, man, like, oh, this is the first time I got to meet like any of the Polish painters. So all of those guys were super cool. And yeah, like the, the show itself was just crazy. Like the, number of vendors and the number of entries were insane like you don't see anything like that in the u.s what about you steven uh definitely mirror the family portion of it uh i'm lucky enough to be able to travel a bunch so i mean I, i've seen a lot of friends fellow like artist friends outside of conventions like even during covid and but seeing them like in this context was was very welcoming. I, I think I only had like a total of two conversations that had anything to do with art, like whatsoever. Everything else was just catching up, uh, family, friends, talking to them about their, you know, how work's going, all that. Uh, I, I don't have to deal with the professional side of stuff like Eric does, thankfully. Uh, a couple people brought things up, but I kind of like, it's, it's, it's my vacation to go to these things, so I don't really want to talk business in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but, the, but the family thing was definitely the big part. I mean, not, not to stress, uh, I, I don't get really hung up about the, the different international communities and who's who, and what country you're from and everything like that. Like we're all a bunch of nerds that make little gaming figures, you know, or, or 75 artistic pieces. Like that's all well and good, but at the heart of it, you know, we're, we're one big community. We're all brothers and sisters and events like these like definitely highlight that you can come together after like two and a half years of not seeing anybody and just, and just click. Uh, and, and that by itself was well worth the experience. And I highly recommend to anybody who's going to want to go in that fashion for sure. Now, have you been, I know Eric's been to Monty. Have you been to other international shows before? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of when you say like shows, you know, when you're talking about like Monte World Model Expo or um, Scale Model Challenge, I think those are very unique in the international like show uh, category. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like traveling and entering painting competitions, yeah, I've been lucky enough to go to the UK a bunch of times and go to Spain. 
Um, Corvus Belly has like their their own version of like their games day called Interplanetario. Uh, I, I love that. I can't speak highly enough about that community and that company in particular. But uh, being on that side of the world, you know, you get to travel and see other places, see other friends. Eric did a bunch of traveling uh, while he was you know wrapping up his trip over to World, uh, world Model Expo. Uh, I think the the UK one was Iron Skull. Uh, which they've done one so far and then COVID hit and they tried doing it two other times and then hopefully it sticks this year. That was a really good event, even for it being like the first one and very much in its infancy. And then uh, Interplanetario, uh, Golden Demon, and, th there, and there was another show in Spain that I can't remember, Fre Freak Wars or something Yeah, Freak those Wars lines. is one of the shows in Spain, yeah. Yeah, so those are all kind of like a little bit more gaming oriented, but even with that, you know, just that, that rich history that, the European countries have when it comes to miniature painting, like they're, they're a little bit more, I don't know, there's something more about them, uh, a little bit more broadening than you would get like stateside. Uh, but that, that's my experience with a lot of those overseas. So this, this was nice to get back on a plane and sleep for nine hours and then get <laughs> off and enjoy a bunch of good company. Well, uh, you hit on something, uh, even, uh, in what you just said that, so like Monty scale model challenge and world model expo are kind of different than other, even other European shows. Can you, can y'all expand on that a little bit more? Uh, Eric's been to two out of those three. So you, you know, <laughs> go ahead, man. yeah, I mean the big, the biggest difference is there, the fact that they're like, everyone there is for miniature art, right? It's, there's no war gaming aspect to Monty or, World Model Expo slash Scale Model Challenge. If anyone that doesn't know World Model Expo is like real briefly, like is a traveling show that happens once every three years. And this year, yeah, <laughs> this year the host of the show was the Scale Model Challenge. So instead of the Scale Model Challenge, the World Model Expo took its place. Uh, the past one, which was five years ago because of COVID, was in chicago and now the next one is going to be basically in paris i forget uh versailles i think it's versailles in three years so uh it's taking place of whatever whichever show that is so um but yeah the, it everyone at this show is purely there for like the hobby the, you know the painting side and the modeling side of of the hobby and um yeah, you get like war game entries and stuff like that, but you don't get the weird questions that you get at like a Adepticon or Nova Open when you're hanging out outside with your friends and some guy comes up to you and he's like, oh, so you playing in any tournaments? Like what, what army did you bring and all this stuff? And you're like, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just here to paint, man. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, okay. That, then let's keep, keep on that same kind of path then uh, differences between the u.s conventions and european convention like the the world model scale model monty what are some of those differences especially for people like me like now that you said that the world model expo is going to be in versailles in three years i i'd almost guarantee my wife's going to make me go yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so real quick I'll, i i just want to touch on like the difference between the scale model challenge slash world model expo and and monte like monte is like a very so it takes place in like a really small town in Italy. Um, it doesn't have like, you, if you saw pictures from World Model X, but it had like a huge vendor hall uh, that doesn't really exist at Monte. Like the show is the main thing. Like people show up, enter, put in their entry, and then they go hang out and just have beers in the plaza right outside the, the castle that it takes place in and go have dinner and whatever it's there's like chimera shows up because they're one of the sponsors of the event and they have like a small stand but like that's it mm -hmm. like it's not it's not the big like shopping trip that some people treat like adepticon or or scale model challenge so it, it's a bit more intimate in that sense but yeah other than that like the the focus on painting is definitely like the same you know but if Steve yeah. wants to talk about like the difference between like an Adepticon and and scale model then or World Model Expo, yeah. 
Yeah, the, the, the gaming thing is probably the biggest part. You know, uh, I know even, I mean, generally when I go to conventions and stuff, it is like, it's an extended holiday for me. So my wife always goes with and we go to another city and we sightsee and do all that couple stuff. Uh, but d during the day, I can usually plan on any, any friends or battle buddies I have in the convention in one or two categories. Either the fellow painters who are teaching from a business aspect, so they can't do anything during the day anyway, outside of maybe a really quick lunch. Or they're in a tournament and they're nested in all that stuff that Eric was talking about. You know, all, all the sidebar nerd conversations about tournament lists and how are you going to do and who's your next opponent. Um, but for, for World Model Expo, and I'm really looking forward to Monte, is especially if it has like a similar vibe, it was literally just drop your stuff off. Yeah, there was a lot more vendors, so you can walk around and buy some stuff. Uh, but for the most part, um, you dropped your stuff off, and then you just ran into writing conversations. There, there are people, friends, who are like, you know, working their booths and everything like that. But comparatively to like a four or five day con, like like a Depticon, um, you get a lot more. You get a lot more touch points. It's a lot more relaxed. You're going there just to enjoy enjoy the company and, and take a look at some really cool models. And and, and I think that convention portion, like for, for, for American conventions, the fact that so much of our painting competitions are nested with that gaming component, I think there's like a certain, it's almost like an expectation or a certain level of like gaming. Everybody wants to like be able to calculate how painting competitions can go. Even in an open system, like on the American side, it has a very different vibe from the open system that you get in any European setting. And then especially what I experienced at a world model expo um if if you're one of those guys who likes to argue about like the subjectiveness of art um if you felt butt hurt about that in the u.s competition like you're probably going to struggle with that in europe if you're looking for some type of calculation or gameism about how to do well in that type of environment it's just not there um i think it's fair to say that i think the the u.s side of the house is just not as mature in the miniature art um, side of the house as you know as Europe is um, so I think with that that maturity comes with just like a very broad definition of what is like a master's category gold silver bronze and all that stuff and I think that's just a lot more accepted on the world stage than it is in the U.S. Um, I'm sure people still get upset about their placements or not placements at a world model expo or scale or monte but I think in the U.S. you tend to get a lot of that heartache like immediately after the event and it doesn't stop for like two or three months <laughs> and i think we've all seen stuff like that all the uh, all the different uh, forums and the chat groups just like explode with hate talk about the events and everything what do you think u.s cons could do better mod like what could they learn from european cons uh, i think the biggest one is like we don't, uh, and I know I've heard MFCA is like mid growing a little bit in terms of being like the opening up to the fantasy side, but mm -hmm. a show like World Model Expo or Monty really brings together like all aspects of the, the like modeling hobby and um, just the love of like figure painting, right? Like the, they had like, I saw a few anime figures. I saw like Gundam models. I saw tanks and dioramas and historicals and fantasy, you know, where I still feel like in the US, all of that stuff is still really separate. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, like I said, I know like a, a show like MFCA is, is attempting to grow like the fantasy or at least like some of the fantasy painters are attempting to like make a showing at, a, at, at there. But the uh, because it's so attached to the wargaming, like you don't see that his historical side of of the uh, shows and like the cross pollination that you get, where like you get some of these historical painters that have been doing the, like painting their way for so long, and they come over and look at some of the the fantasy stuff, and they they look at it and they they're like, oh, that's interesting, you know, that they maybe get ideas for like how they could implement some of those things into their historical pieces and then you get these insane gigantic like dioramas that the historical painters do and the fantasy guys go over and take a look at that and think like oh how could i do like a giant battlefield for a for a historical piece or a fantasy piece right so you get you get like a nice 
cross between the two and they're developing ideas off of each other and everything. And that's just not something that we have currently. Right. I think, you know, I think they're the, it's interesting to me that now that I've done uh, a bunch of like local international plastic model or society shows, and then um, the capital model society show, and then see it going to like ReaperCon and Nova open. It seems to me though, that the places like IPMS are more open to it than places like a Nova open, like no, Nova tried a couple of years ago or a few of not well, one of the last times Nova happened, they tried to have a historical thing and only like got two models, you know, whereas like at the IPMS show that I went to in Richmond, there were almost 80 total fantasy sci-fi models entered, you know what I mean? Which is good for them. You know what I mean? Um, but you know, aircraft with aircraft and tanks are still not <laughs> yeah. the biggest I, thing. I think, I think the biggest problem is like that we're just not talking to each other. Right. right. Like wait, most, most of us don't know that these shows even exist. Like you're talking about a show in Richmond. That's an hour from my house. I, I don't even know what this is. Right. right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know like how we, we get <laughs> these groups talking to each other. Well, I think some of it's also just the, the nature of the beasts themselves. I mean, like the gaming community is what it is, you know, the, the funding and the purpose and the drive for having those types of events is what it is. It's going to be an uphill battle to get a historical painting category to be at something like Adepticon or, or Nova, you know, where it is gaming centric, as opposed to something that's kind of already rooted as a painting competition, accepting just another category of fantasy the, the drive is different the business aspect of it is a lot is a lot different uh and i think there definitely is like like eric said you know there is a need for that open dialogue and bringing them together uh but i also think like some of it's just based in the reality of like what is the purpose of that event what are what are people bringing the businesses together to do if you're going there as an established art competition then you you're already garnering a crowd that is like-minded and set on coming to see and exhibit artistic pieces. Whereas when you go to a gaming convention, I mean, hell, it's in the title, gaming convention. You are going to see the rule of cool. You know, you're, you might not be as open to seeing like a dude on a horseback in a historical setting or a Napoleonic, you know, uniform who's getting judged as such. So I, I think that's a big part of it as well. And that, I think it's funny too, because, you know, there's, Everybody talks about that stigma about like more established artists or artists who are used to going to like more open and diverse shows going to something like Golden Demon, you know, the, oh, well, the Golden Demon judges want to see this and they want to see that. And they put these, you know, they put these walls up and there's, you know, you're constrained to that idea. And we talk about it all, all the time, but I saw the same thing in reverse at World Model Expo where certain models were not being spoken about as favorably for nothing more than the fact that they were gaming figures. Now, I don't mean fantasy, you know, cool, you know, elf right. shit at 75 millimeters is fantasy and that's awesome. But a games workshop wood elf that's painted extremely well by anybody's standards, not being spoken about as favorably simply because it is a gaming figure. You know, I, I, I heard multiple conversations that went down that route and I'm not, I'm not judging one or the other. I think openness is key to that. You know, you got to be, you can't be a hypocrite about judging one without being open to the other, in my opinion. You get, you get into it knowing what you want to get into it uh, or what you want to get out of it. Uh, but I do think it's comical that both communities and both settings are pretty much just like enforcing the stigma of the other one, depending on the environment. Um, a, a buddy of mine there at, at World Model Expo, you know, we happened to, we, we got into long conversations about, uh, games workshop material, you know, the 40K and the Horus Heresy lore. And every time we did, you know, we kind of like, we, we spoke to it, uh, spoke of it in hush whispers in the corner. <laughs> we're like, don't let the other artists hear us talking about Horus Heresy and stuff like that. Uh, and, and I say that jokingly, but you heard things like that when it came to like looking at some of the fantasy figures that were strictly gaming models. Um, so I, I just think that that's funny and that openness definitely needs to happen. Um, and it, hopefully the U.S. is ready for that. Uh, but I, I think that the, like the competition that Eric mentioned where it is rooted in specifically like a painting environment is going to have a lot more success in creating a more well-rounded, you know, world model 
expo slash Monte type environment than trying to force people into that in a convention. Um, I don't know. I think Las Vegas Open is probably one of the ones that could maybe go that route. And that's only because the organizer is so artistically minded. He's quote unquote, one of us. Uh, <laughs> and, he's, and he's very good at organizing people and, and describing where things need to go. And I think because of that combo and that passion that he has, that's probably one of the few you know, gaming conventions that has potential to expand into something that's more inclusive, historical, fantasy, um, the master's category, the, whatever the, the other category, you know, the other divisions were, um, all of that. I think that that's probably a show that's kind of going in that direction, in, in my opinion. Um, and then on the same subject, like the, the Open itself at World Model Expo is probably the biggest eye-opener for me. So in the U.S., you know, like the Open system itself, like we, we've, gone, we've gone to events and we know what that is. But the, the open the open category at World Model Expo was really refreshing. It was enlightening and, and just really really cool to see because it was it wasn't the catch all that it tends to be in U.S. competitions. Like I think when you hear like open category, it's it's almost nothing more than like it's it's the catch all for crap that won't fit in the other categories. Uh, and, and I mean that figuratively and then literally. Like you know, seventy five millimeters are up. It goes in the open. You know, or your base is a 200 millimeters across. It goes in the open. You know, it's almost a size restriction or limitation more than anything else. But at World Model Expo, like it was the majority of the pieces that you saw were completely enveloped collaborations between the artist, most of the time the sculptor, and then the pieces themselves had a very narrative form and function to them. And I thought that that was really cool. Like, uh, you know, a world model, when they, when they cite all the winners for the different categories, like they put their name up there with whatever figure was judged, you know, the best in their display. Um, and when you looked at the open category, when that came up across all of the different levels, all the placements, you generally saw two names. You saw the artist's name and you saw the sculptor's name. And I thought that that was really cool because we don't do as good of a job in that in the U.S. Like, you know, a lot of a lot of the sculptors that we love and praise, like one, we probably don't know who they are because it's not credited properly on the box, or two, they're they're all in Europe, you know, so you don't get a chance to maybe know them personally. Uh, whereas maybe there is something to that with you know just being close proximity friends and being there together at World Model Expo to share each other's like you know work and collaboration. But that whole thing all together to me, I just thought that that was like cool as hell to see. There there were one or two artists that. Uh, that one that were both the sculptor and the painter, so they were the only like singular names, but everybody else had the two name pairing up there, just acknowledging that collaboration. Um, and then of course, you know, like, you know, the, the environmental effects, you know, the narration of the piece and all that, it just seemed a lot more, uh, it seemed a lot more involved than what you're atypically used to in the U.S. Or, or at least it's not portrayed that openly. In, in the U.S. competitions. I don't know, that, that was my take on the open part. That to me was like really cool to see and I really appreciated that. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Like the open tends to be like people's like big one-off unique piece that they do for that competition. And it, it is typically, uh, I mean, you have the occasional people like Kyriakos Simos from Greece or 2A from, from them that like they sculpt and paint their own figure but like most of the time it, you get uh people that are doing a collaboration between the sculptor and the painter yeah it was it was cool because so if you look at the different placements and i, and I had a few conversations after after the after the award ceremony on it which, which were really enlightening uh especially looking into the mindset of like the european artist versus what i would call like the american mindset for miniature painting and one of the biggest things was that um, you might have a, uh, an artist that got, let's say, bronze in the painting open masters or the painting masters, but then they got a silver or they got a gold in open. Or the other way around. Maybe they got a gold in the painting and they got like a bronze in the open. And to me, I thought that was really cool because it really spoke to that collaboration between artists sculptor having a 360 piece on display for the open 
and the amount of love and TLC and everything that went into that and them being viewed uh, in completely different contexts. You know, I don't think we don't, we, you know, I, I don't expect to go to uh, LVO or Adepticon and have somebody look at my entry and consider the sculpt. My sculpt's one of like a million out there. You know, it is a commercially available sculpt. Even if it was a custom sculpt, a one-off, I wouldn't expect that at an American convention. It's, it's not particularly heard of unless there's like a, a specific sculpting category. But even then, usually it's like the green or the print. It's not painted to be a full comprehensive piece. Uh, but, they, you know, at World Model Expo, all of that is being looked at. And, I, you know, that, that was, I guess, like the initial sticker shock for me was that, like, you're looking at my, like, the sculpt, the quality of the sculpt for my piece, like, I had no hand in that. I, I don't know what to do with that information that you just gave me. Uh, but then seeing the sculptor and the artist on the stage together, acknowledging each other's work and kind of pushing each other for that, that one singular masterpiece that they put on display for, for the open is just it's it's a sense of it, it goes back to that family and that community that we mentioned at the beginning of the show you know like it just reinforces that so much uh and and you had people who are coming together for different parts of the world and you know put their entries together for open and i really hope that we can you know american conventions and painting competitions can embrace that openness and in particular i hope they can also like project that message like this is what we should be aiming to be doing it it needs to be acknowledged yeah, well, you know, let, let, let's. That's a, a good way to segue into this. Uh, why don't we talk about uh, your guys' entries into the open? Both of you, you know, I got I, I got to do my rah rah USA really quickly, you know, because you guys represented for sure, uh, like a little bit of Olympic thing going on there, uh, bringing some hardware home. So, Eric, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your uh, entries? Uh, so I had four entries in the painting category, which as Steve just explained, the painting category is like basically for commercially available models. They're just painted, right? Mm -hmm. And you're judged solely on the painting. The sculpt is not judged. Uh, all of which were box arts. Um, I had two pieces by, for Hera, um, a piece for Akalari, and then a piece for Neko Galaxy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you guys are follow like my Instagram or whatever, you've seen all of. The, actually, no, one of them has not been like shown. The fo photos have not come out yet, but uh, all of those pieces were just box art stuff that I've painted in the last, you know, four months or whatever. And then I had two pieces that were collaborations with uh, Joaquin Palacios uh, that were in the open category. One was the Mephiston that I entered at the Golden Demon. And the other was a new piece that's going to eventually be released by Black Crow Miniatures, but it's uh, like a dwarf, uh, like a Viking dwarf riding a boar <laughs> in like a snowy scene, so. Nice, and so the, the dwarf riding the boar won a gold, right? Yeah. And what was the piece in Painters that won a gold? Uh, so I got, a gold for my whole display in painters so that they what what they'll do is like if you have say they judge your whole display as a silver and then you have one piece that like particularly stands out as a gold they'll award you a gold for that one piece but if your whole display is up to like the same level of gold then they give you gold for the whole display so i got gold for my whole display in painting and then i got gold for the dwarf specifically in in uh open i i was told that the robes on my <laughs> on my mephiston were not up to snuff i guess for the gold so <laughs> by one of the judges so yeah so that, that's that's how my my entry shook out and, and everyone's a critic right yeah. Um, and just a side note, uh, we'll have links in the show notes to your, both of your Instagrams. So that way everybody can, if you, uh, I know a bunch of our listeners, if not all of them already follow you. So if, if they have, if they don't, that's their fault, they should get on it right away. Um, so anything, um, 
any to any of the particular pieces like uh for example the the dwarf riding the boar or um it, was there anything that you looked at or or found inspiration from i know you're you're like a, a speed demon painter um I, I, well i as far as like being able to produce a lot of work really quickly um was there anything that you looked at to get inspiration for some of your pieces for the show uh, I mean, the well, the Mephiston, like, is painted to look directly like the book cover for right. for the, uh, Meph- I think it's called, like, Mephiston Revenant Crusade is the name of the book. So that one is painted just look like, straight up like that book cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dwarf was, pa- like, I was requested by, by Isidro, who's the owner of Black Crow Models. The only direction he gave me was, like, I want him to be in a snowy scene. So... Okay, want him to be in a snowy scene. I, I can work with that. And then the model kind of just like it forms itself because it's a Viking, so I've, but also a bit Scottish because it's a dwarf. So I'm kind of mix those two like looks together. So he's got like a tartan on the on the 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 boar has like the saddle has like a tartan pattern on it, and then uh, so he's got like kind of Viking patterning and wrote like runes on on like parts of his tunic so uh but yeah i mean it's basically like all right cool cold ambience i want him to look like he's coming out into the sun or whatever so i'm mixing those two but yeah i mean i don't I, like you said i i don't have a ton of time <laughs> to paint each one of these figures like i i don't get the the liberty to like sit and work on one of these figures for like three months straight uh, like albert albert font who people maybe saw his entry he did this insane dwarf piece with alan carrasco that also won gold in the uh in the open division and it's incredible but he took a year and a half to work on that one piece and it's like cool i, I had to paint mine in in like a week because <laughs> i've got because <laughs> i've got to eat and get on move on to the next you know, figure, right? So now, uh, one of the last follow up question for you is I know, uh, when we've talked about potential of you teaching other classes, I, I had suggested basing and you, you kind of gave me the stink eye. Um, were you, did you struggle a little bit at all with that base or did it come naturally for the snowy base? No, man, that's the easiest, that's the easiest thing in the world. I swear I got like 20 people came up to me and asked me how I did the snow on that base. And I will get, all right, here, everybody wants the tutorial right now. I mixed Woodland Scenic Snow Flock with Elmer's glue. And then I used the airbrush with ink, blue ink to like, just spray some shadows on the snow. <laughs> Done, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't even try. Easiest thing in the world. You didn't even dry brush it at all, or no, (laughs) no dry brush. It is just a layer of ink, but it's because nobody ever paints shadows on their snow. Like they just leave it like pure white. Mm -hmm. So like I, I I guess it was like a mind blowing thing to like see somebody put some shadows on their snow. Yeah, I mean it's not common for sure. All right. Well, thank you, man. Now, Stephen, let's talk about your entries. I know uh, one of them I've gotten to see in person with, uh, and I laughed because I saw the results sheet and it said, uh, lion Lord of the Thundercats. I was like, damn, he went all out. Like he did the whole name. <laughs> so talk to us about your pieces. And, and uh, you were also in the master's category and brought home some hardware. So let, let's hear about that. Yeah, so for, first off, Lion will always get the full title, damn it. All right, <laughs> there's nothing short of that for him. Um, it also tends to be anytime anybody like says his name out loud with the full title, just yell ho right afterwards, like a good proper Thundercat fan should. Um, so that, that one was uh, sculpted by Javier Garcia Urena, who's a, a good friend, and um, I was a fan of his before I even knew who he was. Uh, the last time he had me on, we talked at length about that guy. I, the passion and the love for what he does has not diminished whatsoever. In fact, in the last four months, I've worked on a bunch of different figures for his, uh, from him uh, with the affinity range. Uh, but yeah, put that thing into Open Masters. Yeah, um, to be able to give him credit. Uh, and regrettably, I failed in figuring out how to put his damn name in the entry form. So 
when it popped up on the screen, all it says is Steven Garcia. And of course, the one thing I loved about the open category, having the, the, the painter with the sculptor, I freaking just screwed it up and wasn't able to capitalize on it. Uh, but I apologize to him. I sent him some cookies. We're, we're good to go. He's fine. His feelings aren't hurt. Uh, so yeah, that thing was the only one I entered into uh, Open Masters as a as a one off sculpt as a singular you know special thing, uh, and then in paint, a Masters painting, um, I don't remember how many things I took. For, for me, uh, generally I try to take at least one new thing to every show if I can. Um, I, I don't get the painting time at the desk like you know uh, full, some full time painters get. Um, so I, I struggle to paint for 30 minutes here, or one hour there if I can on the weekend. Um, but this one, like, because it is World Model Expo and it, and it travels and it's kind of like that every three year Olympic setting, uh, I, I allowed, I indulged myself, my pride and decided that anything I've done in the last three years is fair game to go to that thing. Um, so I, I threw in a bunch of stuff into the case. I, I know I took, uh, the Nico Galaxy Day of the Dead version of Nancy that I had done. Um, I took the stuff that I prepared for Golden Demon, which was the Lion and the Wolf and a Dark Angel, um, Primaris Captain. Uh, I took some Infinity stuff, and I think I took two or three, an another 75, and I think another bust. Um, you and brought the Thor bust. Yeah, the Thor bust. Um, there was something else. Oh, well, if it comes to me, I'll think about it. There, there was some worse. Like I said, every anything that I had done in the last three years was was open to me, and really, I just wanted to take stuff because friends had reached out beforehand and asked me to bring specific models that they wanted to see there on site. So that was that was probably one of the bigger motivators for filling up my case as much as I could. In fact, I actually had to build a new case just to take the amount of crap that I wanted to show to friends uh, while I was there. Um, I don't. I really don't remember. I was so excited when they called my name for gold in Painting Masters. I just took off. I didn't even look at the screen. Um, I don't know what if it was my display or if it was a singular figure out of the, out of the batch. To be honest, um, I I think it was the day, uh the dead uh, shoot. I always say it wrong. De Moertes or something like that. Day of the Dead chick that works. Yeah, Day of the Dead. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I was like that. I was like, ah, oh, I haven't seen that. Um, I haven't seen that one of your uh, one of yours. So, but uh, that's I'd like. Is there any uh, like? I guess I'll ask you the same thing with Eric. Where like when doing these any of these pieces, was was there any? thing specific that inspired you or um like i know the infinity stuff that that's a, that's an overall passion you love the game and you've been doing that that's kind of your gateway into the hobby but like into other figures like either the i know the bust we've talked about a little bit about the horns and uh, etc but then what about this uh the the newer piece i guess the the, the day of the dead chick <laughs> well so i actually did the day of the dead chick like three or four years ago for it might have been for Crystal Rush. And um, yeah, it just sat in the case forever. I had to dust it off and everything in order to take it. But the motivation there was just to do something special with Nancy. There, I mean, it's such a great figure. Nico does such a great job with all their all their sculpts. Like that genre just truly really speaks to me. I think sci-fi in general is just underrepresented in the in the larger scale community and the bus community. But um, for, for her, when she was released, there were a bunch of awesome alternate versions and creative things that people had done. I saw one where it was like a, it was like a World War II version, you know, like it was like that that, uh, that tag on the side of the airplane, you know, of that Betty Ross or whatever. Um, there was that version. I'd seen some like heavily inspired Japanese versions. And I hadn't quite seen a Hispanic version yet. Uh, and then at the time I was watching... Uh, Man, there was a show on Netflix that was about like a bunch of kids who were assassins. It was like an assassin school. Um, but anyway, there was a, there was a chick in that in that show that was like a, her character was just a knockoff of a. She was a Hispanic chick, you know, Day of the Dead assassin, and I, you know, that that was really the inspiration for the piece. And uh, it, it was nice, you know, my my grandmother and my grandfather are pretty religious, you know, Roman Catholic, so they're you know, and they're Hispanic, so. A lot of that imagery, you know, some of the more dramatic <laughs> Hispanic religious iconography is like very like singed in my head from just messing up too much as a kid and getting spanked. Uh, so, so most of that stuff resonated with me when I was putting her together, you know, having the, the crown on her head, you know, with the, with the lighting and the different day that they make and stuff like that. So 
that'll always be a piece that I really cherish just because I probably put a little bit more thought into the, the theme of her than I usually do with a lot of the figures I work on. Yeah, and I, I'm looking at it now on Instagram. <laughs> it's gorgeous for sure. Um, and you're right, it was from, from a while ago. Um, I don't know. Then, did, then I'm going to ask you, this is a totally random question. With that part of the heritage, what did you think about the Coco Disney movie? I love it. Uh, we watch that thing probably about four or five times during the year. Uh, it doesn't matter what time of the year it is. If, if it's showing on Netflix or on Hulu live, we usually stop and, and we have it on in the background. And then, of course, at the appropriate time of the year and then Halloween and stuff, you know, we have that, that playing in the background as well. That, that was a really well done movie. Yeah, the colors in that movie are just amazing. And I just got back from Disney, so that's why it's on my mind. <laughs> For somebody, let's say somebody who's a U.S. painter and they want to now try their hand at going internationally, um, what's some of the advice or how can they prepare themselves to make that transition? Um, I mean, I'm kind of I, weary I, of the word transition first off. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the way like Las Vegas Open and, and Nova Open, like, is going that like you you can get like a somewhat similar experience with the like level of the the painting competition right the the biggest difference is just like the the standard division at like world model expo is also super high right so like for me like yeah the the display painting side of it like you have to be really taking the display painting aspect seriously um but i i think if you're if you're doing well and you're enjoying um, the american like competitions uh the specifically the open competitions right like go for it man like and, and even if you're you're not like this is it this is me saying like if you're like trying to compete at like a high level right it, even if you just enjoy the hobby aspect of it like go to one of these shows because you get to see all this amazing work in person and meet all of these amazing painters that you get to like talk to and ask questions and everybody's super nice and willing to have a chat with you. Right. Like, um, yeah, they want to talk about their hobby. Yeah. You know? <laughs> everybody, everybody's here for this. Everybody's there for the same reason. They love to talk about the stuff that they're working on or, or, you know, Hey, can you take a look at my piece and, and show me what you think? Like the same thing happens there, but you've got access to a hundred like renowned painters that are, are willing to, to, to talk to you and, and give you advice and everything. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think you need any specific level to go to one of these shows, but if you're, if you're looking to compete at the, if specifically that's what you want is to go to compete at that level, like, I think you need to make a good showing at one of the, the U S open style shows first. Yeah. Kind of like, uh, uh, what, what is it? Uh, gosh, now what's the analogy with the teeth <laughs> getting your teeth or whatever, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. like when you're uh, teething, there you go. <laughs> Mental block from having three kids. Um, <laughs> Anything from you uh, that, Stephen, about how, how I mean, a transition, I know you, you didn't like the word transition. Um, maybe expand, like you want to expand to the international world. Yeah, that's a better way of framing it. And when I say transition, I don't, I'm not trying to poke fun at you for using that no. word because I, I think that I think transition is what's stuck in a lot of American artists' minds when they think about uh, expanding themselves to go to these other events. And, and, and to be frank, you know, like, um, we know plenty of American artists that would do well at these events. We just happen to get on a plane and go, you know, like we have friends that are extremely capable artists and who are already known on the world, you know, the, the quote unquote world stage, if that's what you're trying to aim for, if you need that prestige to make yourself feel better, they're already there. And if they just bought the plane ticket and could get the time off of work and can get away from their family and, Maybe that's a little too negatively dramatic, but if they could, if they could get, if they could free themselves to go to these events, convince um, their wife, 
or her husband to go on a vacation to Paris. There you go. You know, hard sell, hard sell. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they, they would do just as well. They absolutely would do just as well. There would be more... Uh, I really hate lump, lumping painters into, like, the countries that they're from. I, I think that's a divide that we don't need to, we don't need to expand on. Uh, but there would be more American painters up on stage, hands down, easily, no contest in my mind. They would be golds, they would be silvers. And I wouldn't even go below that for the people I'm thinking of right now, American artists who are, who are at that level. It's, it's another competition. You know, if, if you're operating at that level here in the U.S., you're going to be pleasantly surprised to go to a, a European event and do just as well. Now, I do think there's something to be said for the maturity of the artistic um, environment in each country. Um, you're you're going to be, again, pleasantly surprised when you go to a European event and see how open and diverse the entries are, the people are, the judges are. Uh, but some of that diversity also comes with a higher level of subjectivity. Um, and not, I think that that's sometimes a hard pill for some Americans to swallow. Um, but overall, in this context, I think that if you're, if you're going to an American painting competition, and you're doing well. You're getting goals. You're frequently being told that you're in competition. You know, you're you're competing for best of show. You get one of the top three best of shows if it's like a you know kind of a first, second, and third type thing. Then you're going to go overseas and you're going to do well. You just need to commit the you know the funds if you're able to to go to those events and just be there in person and submit your stuff. So I don't think it's necessarily a transition. I just mm-hmm. think you need to get on the plane and go. You're just going to go to another location. So. Yeah, I think I think what I mean by transition is that the uh, we're ninety nine percent gaming convention, you know, and so that going from the gaming style convention to uh, solely paint focused convention to me would be a transition. I mean, even from like my experience of just doing the Nova Open, going to ReaperCon was completely different. Like I was kind of like, what the hell is this? You know, at first I was surprised by ReaperCon, and so um in a good way in a good way i'm more probably i lean probably more towards the reaper con environment than say the nova open because i don't play the games and so <clears throat> excuse me although i will say this let me harken back to you talked about the sculpt thing the first time i'd ever heard sculpt stuff was eric at reaper con talking to people and going ah yeah you know your paint job's great but god that model sucks <laughs> <laughs> and i was like hey man, you're, no. you're fighting an uphill battle if you pick a really shitty model that's all i'm saying right <laughs> no and i get and you know honestly i didn't there's so many i i guess to, to listeners to, to stress go to as many different types of shows as you possibly can because you get so much information and bits and pieces that you don't even like I never even thought about that prior to ReaperCon, and then after hearing Eric talking to people about the quality of the sculpt, it kind of subconsciously changed the way I look at models. And then I kind of had that aha moment, like, ah, oh, this is where you know I know I remember where I heard it from. You know what I mean? And so like hearing the feedback, and that it wasn't even feedback to me; it was feedback to to other people. Um, and so it was interesting how you kind of glean. It's almost, I don't want to say it's osmosis, but it kind of is like osmosis. Like, you know, being around that environment is so amazing. Um, so, you know, and I, you know, it was awesome to be able to get to hang out with both y'all, but are, are you both doing Nova Open this year? I know Eric's teaching at the Nova Open. I don't know. Are you? I, I am going to be teaching and judging at the Nova Open, so. I am not going to be there. I found out this morning, uh, which really sucks because I got I got asked to be a judge, uh, a judge in an email <laughs> addressed uh, or sent last night. Um, so I'm not going to be there, regrettably. But it, which sucks because there was a lot of friends, you know, good friends, a lot of the community that was going to be there. I was looking forward to it, but no, nope, not this time. I've got a I've got a couple months respite before I prepare for for Monte. Um, go, so going back to your point though, on like the transition from like your gaming figures to like, you know, a display quality, you know, aspiring for something a little bit more, I think calling it a trend at the transition at that point is extremely appropriate. Cause I think that I, I, for one, you know, when people ask me like how, 
how long have you been painting? You know, it's kind of twofold because I've been painting gaming, you know, war gaming figures for, you know, more than a decade. I think most people who are professional painters now fall into the category, but there is a transitional shift in your head where you start taking pieces a lot more seriously and looking at them more comprehensively and you start specifically going for something that's going to inspire somebody in the cap, you know, an artistic piece that is an absolute maximum push of your limitations with a brush. Um, and that's where you kind of get people who are all of a sudden like, oh, well, I've only been painting four years or five years. You know, it's not, you're not trying to like game anybody or lie to people about how long you're painting, but because there is that transitional shift in your mind, you know, painting a, painting an infinity figure as good as I can is not the same as painting a 75 millimeter as, as big as like, you know, as well as I can. Um, although I, w I will say I kind of have a personal crusade when it comes to gaming figures being looked at more artistically. Uh, it goes back to just fighting the man and that, that, that old school <laughs> stigma of needing to like do certain things to compete at a certain level in a certain type of event. Uh, I just hate absolutes. I hate when people just say like, it has to be this way in order to be considered. And I'm like, yeah, screw that. You know, you go against the grain, you can do something else. And that's what like, a lot of that atypical GW standard, you know, that's hyper blended, hyper smooth thing, you know, that was the argument against that style, you know, or has been the argument against that style for the last, you know, decade. And it's right. finally shifted to where that's sinking in, you know, texture is not a big thing. Texture is or a bad thing. Texture is not the enemy. You want texture. It's going to make your piece look that much more involved and cool. Uh, but now that we've shifted towards that way, it's almost like scoffed at to see, the other side of the spectrum and it's the same right. thing with the types of figures that are put into these competitions and again it just goes back to that openness you know uh, we, we need as a community to get better about just acknowledging if we're going to call something art we need to acknowledge that entire spectrum of art and not just go with the crowd into thinking like oh well this has to be what i do because that's quote unquote art i think that's a great it's a great point because I've also noticed, though, things like that you if you go back five years ago and look at YouTube videos, you never hear the phrase visually interesting in tutorials for gaming painting. But now, even in basic tutorials, those type of phrasings are, are starting to come out even. Uh, <coughs> sorry. I even heard uh, volumetric highlighting in a in a gamer YouTube video the other day. I was like, "Well, that that's surprising," you know. I <laughs> didn't even think that 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 would translate in that group. Um, and so it's really it's I I think we're coming along slowly. But I think one of your one, to your point though, do you think part of the issue too in an open system of judging is like why why they're like americans tendency to have to like rubrics i know when i first got into competition style painting i was like well, what are they looking at what are like what are the highest categories and things along those lines and i and, and so i don't know uh, do you think that might be a hindrance i i hate rubrics i have like being like I, i've judged a few competitions at this point and i've had to fill out the like the rubric sheet before and most of the time, for me at least, like the filling out the rubric sheet is like me looking at a piece, deciding what metal it should get, and then justifying like that score on what I've decided to give it on the rubric. Uh, I think it's like puts unnecessary emphasis on certain things that aren't necessarily important to every single piece, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I think like trying to assign numerical values to stuff is, is not the best way to do it. And most of the time, like, yes, we like to say in an open competition that like you're competing against yourself, which is not a hundred percent true. Like really right. you're the golds are setting a bar. Like they, they decide what is the, the gold standard for that competition. And then everything else is kind of judged off of that. Mm -hmm. so uh, the Ru the rubric thing so like you have this sliding scale of like oh well i'll give this uh, the basing gets a nine well what if it's a bust right <laughs> like, is, do i give it a zero for the basing or do i give it a perfect 10 because it doesn't have one like it's just uh, there's stupid stuff like that that i don't 
Well, if you don't do it, you can't make a mistake, right? If yeah. there's no right, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's a that's a whole nother thing where like you you decide to judge like pieces on their flaws instead of their like positive attributes. I I, I try and just like look at at a piece and and see what's good about it, and then assign it a a score or a awarded a medal based off of you know its level within the competition. Nice. That's a great way of looking at it. Yeah, and you are the, like you're all. It, it's interesting in talking to both of you about these things that you're both the way you view judging now is much different than when I was a, a talked to about like got critiques from judges when I first started getting in. Like when I first started getting back it, it, into painting, it was mostly this is what you did wrong. These are the things that you need to work on. It was it was not. It was constructive in the sense it was helpful, but it was not, there was no focus on anything that I accomplished. You know what I mean? And I think that's changing. And like, y'all, like, especially like seeing y'all, because I know you guys judge the, the way you talk about entries is changing things. And I think that's awesome. I appreciate you guys for doing that for sure. You know, it makes people feel better about their painting. But um, so we're, we're getting. You have to focus on the positive. I mean, I think as a general rule in life, you know, you want to, you want to leave, leave on a positive note or start off on a positive note and then constructively give them feedback. It, it always comes back down to that openness for me, which is why I'm so against like absolutes. There is no perfect way of doing it. What you have is an open judge who is capable of objectively looking at a piece and then justifying why they feel a certain piece is what it is in their mind. And then having that same standard when they talk with different participants. I think as long as you have that, and a lot of that comes from experience and judging multiple events in different venues within different concepts a bunch of times before you can develop that mindset. It's not, I think a rubric helps people who are just, who are new to judging and might need a little bit of guidance. Uh, and, but past that, it, it's, that's going to do nothing but hurt the American, you know, like the painting competition scene if you want to look at it for sure. So I don't want to keep you guys too much longer because we're almost at the, about the hour mark, but I, I do want to, I have to go back uh, to Adepticon really quickly. Uh, both of you were there. Uh, Eric, I have got to ask about your entry because I, I, I am so curious. Did you talk to any of the GW people about your 75 millimeter Mephiston and kind of what were they thinking about it? Cause I, I'm going to be honest. I know GW doesn't listen to this podcast. But good. Um, to me, I looked at it. It was almost like a little bit of a middle finger to him. Like, this is how you should, how your model should look. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they didn't take it that way at all. Oh, good. I, I, I talked to all the judges. Like, I, I actually had quite a long conversation with the head judge because, uh, you know, we have a similar kind of, work where he used to paint for heavy metal and I paint for privateer press. We both work for gaming companies and we both, I ran, I was the head judge of the, the P3 painting competition at Adepticon. He's the head judge of the, you know, the golden demon. So like we had a lot of, yeah. <laughs> so, so we had a lot like in common to talk about and you know, they loved it. Like they, they loved it. It's a celebration of like their character. Right. So of course mm -hmm. they think it's super cool. Uh, I, I don't think they take it as like a middle finger at all to be like, yeah, we're going to, I'm going to sculpt a better version or whatever of your figure. For one, it's like five times the size <laughs> of a, of a 32 millimeter Mephiston. Like he's 75 millimeters, but it's a, it's a big figure. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, no, I didn't mean that you were giving, I was just being kind of funny that I was just joking about the middle finger thing, but um, that I was just curious about what their, how they reacted kind of one of them was mad at me because that's the only category they're allowed to enter. <laughs> <laughs> nice, you know, nice. That, that, that's how a lot of people see that type of stuff though. For from a GW lens, like I was lucky enough to have like a two hour conversation at world model expo with like their, their actual like art director, the guy who's in charge of all golden demons, the way that they're run, the way that they're organized, he does everything. And it was hmm. really enlightening because he he's pushing in a direction that we would you know especially in the context of this conversation we would love to see 
something like Golden Week even go down? A more open system, you know, not as as constrained as a lot of people think it is. Uh, but you know, when you're entering a vendor specific competition, again, it goes into like knowing what you're getting into. Right. You're you're going into their world, into their environment, and if you're not ready to play ball and you get upset with how you do, like, kind of feel like that's on you. You didn't prepare yourself mentally for what you were getting into. But I was very, very surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear that they're the guy who is pushing the format and how Golden Demons are run is actively like fighting, you know, the business side of, you know, the man of GW to create an event that is much more diverse uh, and open to into a, you know, into a way that we would definitely benefit from as a community. That's all, that, that's good to hear. Hopefully, that there'll be some success with that over the over the years because there are just way too many amazing entries that you know what I'm saying that did not get uh, the credit they deserved. Like even just Look, I didn't get to see the display case. We could we could do a whole podcast about my feelings yeah. on how how the yeah. Golden Demon went, but yeah, it's uh no, nah, it's I mean Steve crushed it at Golden Demon also. Yeah. My, if I had any middle finger at all to the Golden Demon, it was only entering open because I was like, I don't really feel like painting a. Right. It, it, it's not that I dislike Games Workshop figures and small Space Marines. It's just not something that, like in my free time, I, I want to do. I I paint gaming figures for a living. Mm -hmm. I want to paint like something, something big and exciting. You know. That makes sense. That's, that's fair. But did you you did uh. You had that that war cry dude. You did. Why? Why did yeah. you bring him? I forgot. <laughs> I forgot he was even in my case. <laughs> and honestly, like he would have got it, that figure would have got crushed by by the like level of detail and 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 a, like just technical perfection that people put on their figures and like Robin McLeod and uh, what was his what's his name Gavin that like won the Slayer Sword. Like, come on. Like my war cry dude that I painted in like two like a few days and like that's eh, pretty good. <laughs> like <laughs> it would not have stood a chance of getting uh top three in that category. You, you know, fair enough. Fair enough. Hey, you know, that's uh, it's always good to be able to look at uh things under perspective. Now, um Steven, really quickly, uh I wanted to touch with this too. Like uh you went to Las Vegas Open. And you you kind of cleaned up there a, a little bit. Uh, was it like it, it took like four pictures to get all the award? Like you know, with you holding all the awards and everything. Uh, so is, can you give us a brief like kind of little summary of uh, a Las Vegas Open? Uh, I came, I saw, I conquered. That was it. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. That is a that fair is, description. That is can't that stop is winning. Can that is completely contrary to my my viewings of my work. Sorry, right. nobody's gonna bash my stuff more than me. Uh, but it, it was it was I was pleasantly surprised to do that well in the event. You know, it's always cool to hear things like for the first time ever. You know, those types of accolades. And I, I think for me though, overall, it was just there were some other high level competitors there, um, friends and people that I speak with. You know, online and you know on a weekly basis, and uh, just getting to see all the pieces together and see the the quality and the caliber of that event rise from the people who are in attendance that, that by itself would have been, you know, that, that was awesome to see. And I hope that's a trend and I'm, I'm fairly positive. That's going to be a trend that continues with, with LBO going forward for sure. Fantastic. That's awesome. Uh, guys, I really appreciate uh, you guys being on and giving us a kind of, this is such an educational thing for those of us who are looking forward to down the road, getting into the international world, not necessarily even a competition thing, but I just want to go see it. You know, like it just sounds like it, Eric, what was the number of entries at the world model expo you'd said? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I know pre-registration itself was like 4,500 entries. And I think they maybe got close to 5,000, like at the show. They Holy had to add shit. more tape. Like they were constantly like trying to like push figures together and they had to add more tables to the, to the show floor and stuff like overnight. It, it was insane how many like individual pieces there were. Now, is that unique or is that, is that, is that a unique, uh, like a common thing or is that maybe COVID caused a bump in the. Uh, 
I I can't say exactly because I haven't. I mean, I know like Monty gets a whole lot of entries, but that's a like <laughs> four thousand six hundred entries is a ton. So I I know like uh, Mikhail Pisarski, for example, brought like twenty five pieces or something of like all figures he's painted over the last like three years. So yeah, I think I think it's a a bit of COVID and <laughs> and. Uh, a bit of people just being super stoked to get back to a show. Yeah, it was, the final number was like 48 and some change, and I, I think it's safe to say that that was, you know, that World Model Expo is always going to be a big show because it is the Olympics every three years. You got three years worth of stuff, but COVID definitely had something to do with that. People bringing that many of entries, you know, from the, the isolation and the, 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 the nerddom and freedom of being able to sit at your desk for months on end. Like, yeah, that definitely had a, that was a factor in the quantity for sure. <laughs> That's that's freaking impressive. Now, um, Eric, remind listeners where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Eric, E-R-I-K underscore Swinson, S-W-I-N-S-O-N. You can also follow me on Twitch at the same thing, twitch.tv slash Eric Swinson, though I only stream sometimes because sadly I have to paint a lot of things that I'm not allowed to show on stream. So... <laughs> Nice. And uh, Stephen, what about you? Uh, you can find me at the local tequila repository in Austin, Texas. On nice. Friday, every Friday night now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> on Instagram, hold on, I gotta look up what the freaking name on there is. Uh, Torque Thor is my handle on Instagram, and that's pretty much it for me right now. This is still hobby time for me that I have to manage in between doing uh, other uh, boring work stuff. Nice. And I, we'll link everything in the, the show notes and everything, but uh, thank you guys so much for, for uh, spending your time. I know you, uh, you probably, hopefully you you finished the jet lag by now, <laughs> but uh, let's see anything else. I'm looking over my questions. No, I think I got everything. A little bit of duck time, a little bit of LBO. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being on and uh, spending your time with us. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, always, always a pleasure. Awesome. Dan and I would like to thank Eric Swinson and Stephen Garcia for joining us today. And again, congratulations to both of them on such an amazing performance at the World Model Expo. Uh, really enjoy getting a talk to you guys and look at your work. And uh, I have to say thank you so much for uh, uh, the knowledge you impart on us. I, I always take a lot away from our conversations. Uh, you can follow both Eric and Stephen on Instagram. Uh, I'll have links in the show notes uh, for you to be able to click directly on them and also Eric, a link to Eric's Twitch stream. Um, you could follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Listening to Paint Try. Uh, Listening to Paint Try. You can also drop us a line at Listening to Paint Try at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have uh, thoughts, or concerns, anything about what you're working on, if you're going to be at ReaperCon or Nova Open, let us know so we can uh, hang out. Dan will be really easy to find since he'll be behind the Capital Pallet most the table most of the time. Anyways, thank you again for listening. Like, subscribe, or follow wherever you get your podcasts. And and just so you all know, we'll have another episode right after this one. Uh, so it'll be awesome uh, to be able to get uh, start kicking out content again. And again, we'll be putting out uh, stuff during ReaperCon and during the Nova Open. And so just like Stephen and Eric talked about today, be open to becoming a better, braver, happier painter. Until next time. Listening to Paint Dry with Mike and Dan is a production of LTPDWMD. All rights reserved. No portion of this recording may be used without the express written consent of the host. The music is Death by a Thousand Questions by Springtide. Download from the free music archive on a non-commercial attribution share alike basis. All views and opinions expressed in the show are solely the views and opinions of the person who said them. All celebrity voices, if any, were impersonated and done so poorly.